So this is the second part of our discussion on how political transitions create, can create an environment in which elites are making choices to hold on to power and how those choices can potentially foster violence. Uh, we talked about Paul Collier's sort of um, perspective where he's looking at sort of the incentives facing elites and the choices set that they might have. Uh, this discussion will be focus more around Jack Snyder's book, From Voting to Violence, which is a really fantastic book. It's one of the best works of social science I've ever come across. It also reads really well um, back in the 1990s when ethnic conflict was, was um, quite common and, and was uh, sort of the dominant question in political science and, and also popular sort of conversations. Uh, Jack Snyder's Voting to Violence was you know, widely sold at Barnes and Noble, it was, it was a, a commonly read book. And he asked the question, why is it that we see democratization movements spawning nationalistic violence in some cases, but not in others, which is, I think, a really interesting question. And he comes at it from a different perspective than Collier, but also a similar kind of perspective uh, from Collier. So Snyder's thinking about this in more of a historical context, and he's noting that for a state to function, there has to be some mechanism to legitimize that rule, right? It could be people believe in the divine right of kings, and therefore they assume that their leaders are, are appointed you know, by heaven, um, or there may be some sort of legitimizing ideology, but at the very minimum, you need acquiescence, so people aren't you know, regularly rising up and, and murdering your elite. Um, Ideally, there's some level of acceptance that the state has legitimacy. Um, and if you can get the population to actively support the state, that's great. That means that rather than just grumbling and paying taxes, people will actually you know, pay taxes um, when there's need rather than trying to hide money and evade taxes. It means that when there's uh, a need to raise military, people won't just sort of acquiesce to conscription, but may actually um, sign up and, and enroll in the military to, to defend the state. And so the idea is that when people feel an emotional attachment to their state, they're willing to make those kind of great sacrifices, like pay higher taxes or military service. Um, and so leaders knowing that may seek not just to foster acquiescence on the part of a population, but may actually try to build that kind of emotional attachment, that kind of emotional bond to the state. Um, and, and nationalism seems to be the mechanism that leaders and and people have kind of fallen into over the last 500 years or so to try to build that link and forge that link between a population and its state um, where there's that emotional connection that, that binds the two together. And that has really big implications for military power. Um, that the willingness of um, people to engage in sacrifice for the sake of their state is incredibly powerful as, as a military tool, um, but it also means that elites are in a position to maybe cultivate that. They may have incentives to cultivate that for their own internal purposes, um, staying in power, conquering neighboring territory, um, and they may seek to manipulate people's identities, right? Building up a sense of national identity, um, building up a sense of, of um, in-group, out-group dynamics. And the elites are able to do this, as we've talked about, because they control resources, right? The very definition of an elite that we've been using is somebody who is in a position to sway the opinions of others. Maybe they control the media, or maybe they control you know, pulpits. Um, maybe they're able to um, control major organizations that can, again, shape um, how society operates, bureaucracies, guilds, whatever. Um, and so the question is, when they have that power and they maybe are, are seeking to use it to forge an identity that's going to legitimize their position in society, are they using that power in a way that is going to strengthen political institutions? Are they using that power in a way that's going to lead to violence? Um, are they using that power to defend current political institutions? Or are they in a position to adapt and change as society adapts and changes? And that ability of elites to adapt and change, to use their resources, not just in a way of like, I'm gonna hold on to power, but as things change around me, I can retain my power while not trying to control that process of change, ends up being really important for, for Jack Snyder. And he, well, I'm gonna pull this up uh, full screen because I think I wanna talk through this um, in a little bit of, of detail. 
he creates a sort of two by two table out of the experience of sort of um, the emergence of European nationalism that he thinks accounts for different ways that we see nationalism playing out in societies and the different implications that has for violence. And so he notes that we have situations where elites are adaptable, um, they have their resources, but they can shift those resources into other means versus an unadaptable elite. So an elite that's wedded to a uh, feudal land distribution, right? And where the power of, of the elite comes from controlling land, it's very difficult for that elite to imagine a world in which they in which there's been land reform, in which the peasants have been sort of liberated, um, in which they, they can imagine holding on to power. And so um, we might want to think about that adaptable versus unadaptable um, thinking on the part of the elites, and then whether the political institutions, the social institutions um, that a state has, whether those are strong or whether those are weak. And Snyder says that when you have adaptable elites with strong institutions, um, you get a form of civic nationalism. And he, he, points to Britain as sort of the ideal example of this, um, that's willing to be politically open, that's willing to be democratic, that the elites believe that they can engage in a discourse-driven politics, um, they can contest through democratic processes, and they'll be successful that way. And so they, they have an incentive to sort of build up those state institutions to reinforce them and to, to direct them toward democratic uh, practices. Whereas if you have strong state institutions um, but an unadaptable elite, you may end up facing sort of a, a, a reactionary or a counter-revolutionary elite. Um, and I think he points to Germany here as an example in which the elite are, are sort of wedded to these, these institutions, they're wedded to certain centers of power, and they're very hostile to, um, to change, they're very hostile to democratic reform, but they are in a position because the state is strong uh, to be able to foster a certain type of nationalism. Um, and Snyder says that that type of nationalism is going to be repressive. Um, it may be uh, aggressive and, and uh, attack others, um, but it will be mostly focused on maintaining power at home. And then he talks about situations where the state is weak, um, but the elite are maybe adaptable. And so he talks about revolutionary France as an example of this, um, where the old order was completely destroyed and the new order was um, replaced with, with elites that were willing to, to change and, and do something different. But because the old order was, was upended, um, the political institutions, the social institutions weren't in a position to constrain leaders. And so you can get um, demagogues rising to power um, and that can be potentially unstable. And so again, revolutionary France is our, our sort of classic example here. And then you have an unadaptable elite who are sort of wedded to that old order, but the state is really pretty weak and underdeveloped. Um, and so actually you don't even necessarily need to uh, foster a strong sense of, of nationalism. Um, maybe all you need to do is just prey on in-group, out-group dynamics. And so Snyder also talks about sort of an ethnic um, nationalism that can be uh, that can also play a role in in national political development um, I think he points to Serbia as an example where this plays out but and while I thought I kind of like the case studies that Snyder has for each of these four different sort of ideal types of nationalism what I really loved about his book uh, was his discussion about political transitions in Eastern Europe and I did my best to try to like crystallized down um, a, a really interesting chapter about why we see violence in some places in Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union, and we don't see violence in other places. And Snyder's argument essentially is that you're gonna see violence um, where state institutions are less well-developed um, and social institutions and civil society are less well-developed recognizing obviously that um, a lot of these countries underwent 40 years of, of fairly repressive governments that's tried everything they could to dismantle civil society and um, state order. But Snyder sort of looks back and says, sort of where were you prior to that sort of communist um, experience? Was the state functioning? Was the state um, operating? Was there a civic nationalism or, or a, a, a state identity prior to that? And if there was, those are, are sort of the areas that are flagged in sort of dark green on the top. Um, the areas of maybe middle green are areas where the state wasn't maybe um, particularly well-developed. It maybe didn't have a long history. It had maybe weak 
political and social institutions. Maybe there was weak cohesion amongst the population. Um, and he flags those as, as the areas that are probably most likely to experience violence um, because they're not going to have the traditions of civil society. They're going to restrain um, the competing of elites, and it's going to create incentives for either nationalistic, ethnic kind of violence or reactionary kind of violence. Uh, and then there's that third sort of category, the light green, that's sort of often in Central Asia. And Snyder argues that these are areas that didn't have um, really functioning states prior to um, sort of Soviet occupation. And he is arguing that the political development in these areas is so low um, as a matter of like people not being politically mobilized, people not sort of having developed a national consciousness uh, around their state, that elites don't even have to bother mobilizing the population, that the population isn't going to be a factor that they can safely rely upon the population to be acquiescent. And so in that situation, elites don't have any incentives to try to manipulate nationalism, and therefore he's not expecting to see lots of violence. And Snyder's sort of story, and that is best I'm trying to like map it into sort of these three colors, um, actually seems to do a pretty good job of explaining where we do see violence. Um, it, it tends to be in Russia and uh, Moldova and then Yugoslavia and then in the Caucasus where you see those sort of intermediate ranges of, of political development where there's just enough for the populations to be mobilized, for elites to need to be able to leverage um, nationalism to be able to control and contest amongst um, themselves and that population, whereas um, in the darker green areas, there's enough sort of political guardrails from a previous age of experience with, with self-rule that hopefully is able to constrain that, that political violence. Um, I think it's a provocative thesis. Um, I think it's probably been critiqued, uh, which is pretty normal um, for academic arguments, um, but it's it's a really well done book and I'm, I'm doing my best to kind of give the highlights of, of what I think it, it does well. Um, I would encourage folks to take a look at it. Snyder's probably, um, in my mind, one of the folks who does that sort of merger of history and political science probably the best. So, so this is my pitch for it, um, hopefully, uh, the argument came through reasonably well.